Keith Jackson, one of the great broadcasters, gave me two pieces of advice. He said, um, uh, say what you see as an analyst and be brief. So I intend to do both those today, but I want to leave you with a couple of nuggets to be sure. For all of us, there's this element of time. And maybe as a back way to end into my comments, to enter into my comments, I'm going to frame you up with this. Uh, Zorn Kierkegaard said it best, a 17th century theologian. He said, all of us must make noise on New Year's Eve to drown out the macabre sound of grass growing over our graves. It was better when we had hourglasses, Mark, because the clocks deceive us. But we had to invent them because we needed the deception. For the rotating hands give us the illusion that time goes on forever. And meanwhile, we curse the hourglass because indeed, it is a constant reminder that time is truly running out. Now, for the athlete, we perfect the art, and as coaches, we support this in some ways. We perfect the art of repressing the reality that time is running out, right? I remember as a kid putting on that helmet, and as a pro, the Noxay emblem on the back that's stamped in there, it says using this helmet to butt spear ram can cause paralysis or death. I committed it to memory, right? We all saw it when we put the helmet on, and we know it's inherently challenging despite the fact that we've changed the rules. This is a tough game. It's not for the faint of heart. But in order to have confidence, you have to be able to demonstrate that ability, and you have to not be thinking about those things. So we become experts at repressing that reality. But just as a note of introduction, what follows today in my comments, please move with urgency as you go about the task of building young men, because I can think of no greater calling in the context of the times that we're operating in right now than it is to be a coach and to be able to influence and impact the lives of young men and young women in this nation today. By the time I finish, I hope that you'll have a, a more clear picture of the context so that it will fuel your passion. You know, coaches of all stations are under tremendous pressure to achieve their goals. Everything from keeping kids eligible to controlling the impact of social media on their behavior, you choose what you insert in that category. The challenges are plentiful. Every obstacle that was there before, even the new barriers that didn't exist 30 years ago when I played this game, that stand between where we hope to be and where we are currently are, are threatening the mission of coaches across this nation to build strong programs, to produce men and women of character who become active participants and not detached spectators. Because of these pressures, coaches would do well to remind themselves why they do what they do. So I wanna share some perspective on the power of a coach's influence. And I've got a graphic I wanna show you because I think this is the heart of what we're trying to communicate. According to Gallup, there are three contexts in which the best conditions for learning occur. And if you're writing, if you want a gra photographic memory, there's a reason why we've got the rule of threes working because it's easy to remember these. But quickly you'll be able to identify that as a coach, you are in the throes of the context that the best type of learning takes place. The insertion into foreign territory, um, learning a new offensive system, if you're moving from one place to the next, a, a parent that has to deal with kids who have been in a foster system, or maybe you as a coach are having to deal with kids who have moved many times before for various reasons. Fatherlessness, we all know that that's a huge problem. When they're inserted into foreign territory, that new person that comes in the household that may not be the biological father, there's a different adjustment that has to take place. There are a myriad, and I'm just scratching the surface of the context in which you and the kids that you coach will be inserted into foreign territory. You're here in part to learn about new policies that will have to be implemented. We talked about keeping kids eligible and things of that nature. All of these have the capacity to insert us into places that we've never been before. And there's an adjustment. We don't tend to move with a certain confidence and conviction uh, as if we were when we were in the throes of it for a long period of time. Uh, Nick Saban used to talk about this all the time. He and I have had great discussions. He says, you know, the greatest ability is dependability. And dependability comes as a result of being familiar with the context. But today, because of some of the factors that we're going to unpack quickly, these kids are in unstable situations. The second one is sudden loss, the death of a loved one, the loss of a job. I was looking and I recognized a couple of coaches coming in. Some of them I remember from the college days that I had occasion to share some things with them. One of them said pointedly, finally landed a job. It's tough out there, very difficult. According to Gallup, there are seven billion people on planet Earth. And of those seven billion, five billion are adults age 
15 and older. These are global numbers. And of those 15, three tell Gallup they are either full-time formally employed or seeking full-time formal employment. The problem is there are only 1.8 billion full-time formal jobs in the world today. So that leaves, if you're doing the math, 1.2 billion shortfall of full-time formal jobs. So what, what I'm trying to suggest to you is that times are tough. And I don't care what, and again, I'm not being political here, what numbers the government puts forth, these are unprecedented challenging time for some of the reasons that I'm talking about. And then that last segment is mentor and relationship. And this cuts to the heart of the matter, and that's really what I came to share with you today. I want to focus on this last one, mentor and relationships, because each one of you today, because of your position, occupy, you fall into this category. The relationships you have with your student athletes have the potential to produce the greatest opportunity for growth and development. And when you think about that, that's absolutely amazing. What an awesome responsibility. And in fact, it may be even a little bit scary if you think about it too long. But I can hear, I'm here to tell you, and I'm sure as coaches you could be great testimonies to this, the payoff to contributing to a positive transformation of a kid who without your influence would likely fail is worth the investment of your time and your talents. So here's the secret sauce. In order to exert effective influence as coaches, you must be aware of what you're up against. Why? Because the context determines your strategy. Now that's not unfamiliar language to us, and I don't care what side of the fence you're on, if you saw the Super Bowl this past year, and I looked at the formation, you know, if you were a passing enthusiast, which we're in a wide open context these days for spread formation, you could have made that work if everybody would have executed well. So I'm not going to knock that. But I do have to challenge this one particular point with respect to the context determine your strategy. I was looking at the numbers and I didn't hear one analyst say anything about this. Do you know the New England Patriots will rank dead last in the National Football League in green zone defensive efficiency against the run? Dead last. I wouldn't have tried to be cute. Now, I know there are a lot of passing guys in here, but I would have turned around and hand the ball off. And I mean, that seems like an obvious thing to say. Everybody did the recon, and I know what the formation was. It looked like the, it was wide open. Yeah, it, it was there. But I probably would have run the football. I'm a hard hat, lunch pail kind of guy. You know, it's just the way I'm wired. I know we got a lot of spread gurus in here, but that's what I would have done because the context told me, not just because of some intrinsic aspect of what I feel about the game, but because I wanted to exploit a weakness. So New England, despite being ranked fifth overall in total defense, they were dead last against the run inside the five-yard line. So I wouldn't have tried to be cute, so I digress a little bit. But the context does inform our strategy. So here's one of the great challenges, information technology. That's changed how student athletes perceive the world and the decisions they make on a daily basis. The era of the internet athlete has changed the game for coaches in many ways. In response, it's time to change the culture and behavior among student athletes. It's time that we reinstill responsibility and accountability and leadership. But we'll take a new approach to accomplish this. We're going to have to be mentors and not just coaches because the context of our times demand it. It's not an option. You say we're swamped already. We've got more on our plate. Yes, you absolutely do. But the conditions are very real. DW and I were talking about it a moment ago. Fatherlessness is a major, major concern. I don't have to tell you guys, you, you know it. You deal with it all the time. And so we have this major chasm between what kids used to know was the right thing and what was taught in their homes versus what they are. And you're saddled with coaches with having to correct that and, and actually even engaging to some large degree in some form of uh, remedial training to get them back where they need to be before you can even begin to talk about coaching them to become better athletes. It is the aforementioned confluence of these factors that has resulted in the inconsistent performance, inflated egos, detachment from reality, a lack of discipline, and critical lapses of judgment on the field. Where there have always been a few isolated examples of bad behavior, the growing influence of the media is impacting a larger population of our athletes than ever before. Your effectiveness as coaches is tied directly to your capacity, once again, to be a mentor. And I've had many coaches who did more than just win, they mentored me. One such coach was Barry Switzer. Has a reputation of being a wild gunslinger kind of a guy, you know, free spirit. 
But Barry Switzer had a unique capacity to understand the context of my situation and put his finger on the pulse of what would motivate me. He knew I was the son of a missionary. He knew that I grew up in North Tulsa, Oklahoma, broke as the Ten Commandments. We didn't have much growing up. But what he did understand is that if he told me I love him, and if he told me that, he knew that would make a difference to me. Because those are the things that my missionary mother taught us about in the Tillman household. And one day as a wide-eyed freshman, playing against Nebraska, I was scared. Didn't know what I was going to do, hope to do, train, practice. Barry Switzer pulled me to the side. 82,000 people in Memorial Stadium, jam-packed, small stadium by those standards today, but it was full. And he just grabbed me by the shoulders and he looked at me in the eye. And I can tell you, 30 years later, gentlemen, I still get emotional about it because of the impact it had on me. He said, Spencer, and this is my best Barry Switzer, he said, Spencer, I want you to know, son. He jet that old jaw out to mom. He says, I just want you to know something. The way you take care of Doug, Kathy, and Greg, those were his kids. He only allowed three people to babysit him, me, Mac Brown, and Joe Washington. He says, the way you take care of Doug, Kathy, and Greg, taking them back and forth to Arkansas for me, I want you to know, son, I love you. I'd do anything in the world for you. And I said, coach, I'm trying to get hype. You can't be talking about love when I'm trying to get hype for the game. But he knew that was my language. He knew that that's what I needed, despite on the outside. And I was a pretty demure kid. I, you know, I didn't wear gold chains. I didn't have my pants hanging out off my butt. That was not my thing. But yet I still had this external facade, if you will. I, I wanted to be tough. But he knew that my language was love. And he did exactly what was required to connect and relate with me. Barry Switzer understood that he had to be a mentor. Bill Walsh took me down on the wharf post his career, spent three days with me explaining to me the concept of where the red zone came up with. And he mentored me and helped me understand it. And he would say things like, Spencer, you know, good coaches know how to do things, but the truly great ones know why they do what they do. And when that narrative comes on, when you're in the throes and you're dealing with that cantankerous trifling kid that can't get it right, that seems to be undermining everything you're trying to coach, he turns on that reel and he says, I know why I'm doing what I'm doing. Because the context of our times determine it. And if nobody else steps in that gap, because of the conditions of our times, we can predict where they will be in 10, 15, 20 years down the road. It's not an if, it's only a matter of time until they end up in jail or worse. So this is why we do what we do. Bill Walsh would sit down and explain to me concepts like, he said, you know why we came up with the red zone concept? I said, no coach, you help me out. I, I, I want to know that. And he says, well, I needed to come up with some kind of a Pavlovian response mechanism to get our guys to um, understand that the context of the red zone totally changed. When you got in this area, something unique was about to happen. Um, the field shrinks from 6,500 square yards to 1,300. The defense doesn't have to defend the pass, the deep ball, so they can put their defenders closer to the line of scrimmage, which makes running the football that much more difficult. But how do I get that across to my guys? He always stacked the red zone preparation at the end of practice. And when that horn blew and we heard our managers say, you know, red zone, red zone, you could literally see the countenance of everybody change. Guys got off their helmets. Veterans and even younger players began to hit the older players and the younger players and coach and police themselves. Bill Walsh knew something, that if practice was not efficient in the red zone area, it would continue indefinitely and no one knew when it was going to end. He was working that mind game. He was helping us become better men, but he understood that what we valued most was our freedom, our time, and the ability to get out of that sweltering heat and go do whatever it is that we wanted to do for the remainder of that day. So if we executed well in that session, practice would be over with. But once again, if we didn't, practice would continue indefinitely. And he began to teach me those mechanisms. These are things that you know intuitively, instinctively as coaches, but they didn't come in the context of a football field. He would never have told me that on the field. This was when he was suffering with cancer at that point in time, and he called me to come to San Francisco to spend three days with him on the wharf to talk about it. And he explained to me why they brought me to San Francisco in the first place. And I thought it was because I was a pretty decent running back out of Oklahoma. He says, no, Roger Craig's our number one. <laughs> nah, he's going to start. And I said, I know it hurts you even more because he's a cornhusker, but you're going to have to deal with it. We want you here because of your leadership. Do you know I was almost six months into my stay there before I figured out why I was sitting in between Joe Montana and Steve Young. Steve Young was a curly head kid that didn't understand top from bottom. 
And I said, well, wh why am I not with the other running backs? He says, you be Spencer, and I'll tell you a few years down the road. Long story short, gentlemen, one day, six months after that, we're in minicamp, season's over with. Steve Young comes up to me and says, Spencer, how do you do it? He says, you're coming out here and practice, you know, <laughs> he used the word, the phrase, elbows and assholes. He said, you, you do everything 100 miles an hour. He said, how do you do it? And you're playing behind Roger Craig. You know, you went to Oklahoma, you're a pretty good back. And what he was really saying to me is that I'm a pretty darn athlete, good athlete myself, but I'm playing behind Joe Montana. I think I'm better than Joe Montana. I was thinking, wait a minute now, you, I don't know if you're better than Joe. Yeah, man. No, but athletically, and his numbers for efficiency are right up there with Joe, and in some cases it's better. But he was struggling with that. And so they put me in the position of leadership to be an influence on him. And do you know, DW, that about four days from that six-month benchmark, he came up to me and said, Spencer, what do you do on Tuesdays? I said, well, Brent Jones and I, we have a prayer you know, meeting at his apartment, and we started, he started going to prayer meetings with us. This is the third generation Mormon going to prayer meetings with us, Judeo-Christian guys, right? How cool is that? But it didn't happen but for the fact that I was a mentor, and I didn't even know it at the time, but, but there were people who were in mentor capacities that influenced me, that understood the context of their time and were orchestrating all of it. I had nothing to do with him becoming a great player, that's for sure, I can't take credit for that. He had that, but all I could do is be an example and encourage him when his dauber was down from time to time. Bill Noble, lastly, was a mentor for me as well. And I'll end with these thoughts here. Bill um, was a track guy at the University of Oklahoma. He knew the difficult situation we grew up in in Tulsa, and he gave me an opportunity to work for him in his steel mill in, North, in uh, West Tulsa. And I worked alongside with his son. He taught me the value of earning money and what it really meant. He taught me to understand the truth that money always follows, it never leads. Think about that for a minute. That's just the opposite of what our culture teaches us. We're in a, a Burger King society where we want it our way and we want it quickly, we want it yesterday. So these are examples of coaches who understood the extraordinary context in which they were being raised in or they were having to coach me in and they mentored me accordingly. And so we must pick up the mantle and do the same thing. The difficult truth is, it ain't enough to just be a coach anymore. We can no longer bring bows and arrows to what has become a gunfight. So coaches may have to have more resources than others, and they'll have to call upon those resources. And they'll be pressed into situations that may be foreign to them, but they're gonna to have to ask some of their associates and their friends, get on the horn and say, hey, what would you do about this situation? They're gonna to have to find ways to come up with creative solutions to solve very difficult problems. I'm reminded as I close of a situation in 1995 when, I know you got a bunch of coaches here, but this is uh, for those of you that may appreciate music. There was a noted violinist named Itzhak Perlman. And Perlman, world renowned, suffered from polio as a child and it left him crippled. And I was in New York City in 1995, coaches, when he performed one of the greatest performances I've ever seen in my life. He made it a habit to always have the curtains open and not drawn as he made his way to center stage. And if you're watching in the audience, it's quite uncomfortable because it's tough to see a man labor like that to that center point. And it was quiet and uncomfortable for people, sophisticated crowd who understood music. But this particular occasion, he came in that same manner and sat down middle stage. And you could hear, because of the acoustics of the room, every iota, every sound, every timbre, every instrument, every move of a bow that was moved in that room, you could hear it. It was perfect. And I remember specifically hearing the clasp undone on his braces on his legs. And then he laid down the crutches and he put the other claps down and he swung his leg over and he folded the other leg back, his favorite preferred position. And then he began to engage into this wonderful sonata. And about 14 movements in, it was like a shot. The G string on his Stradivarius popped. And all those sophisticated people in that audience were like you. They were saying, wow, what's going on? What is he gonna do now? Quiet. And the virtuoso that he was, DW, he looked up in the air, closed his eyes for a moment, 
And then we reopened them. He took his bow and motioned it to the conductor to begin again. Little did we know at the time what he was doing was reconfiguring the arrangement of the song. Only a trained coach, only a trained versaroso can look at a kid who's struggling in an area and in real time make the adjustments that's necessary to put that kid on the right path. Itzhak Perlman essentially recomposed the piece and what followed in the minutes afterwards elicited a resounding applause from the audience. They had watched a master under the most difficult of circumstances turn a tragedy into a triumph. And Mark, when he finished, he reached in his back pocket and he pulled out uh, a handkerchief and he wiped his brow. I was four rows deep and he said, you know, sometimes it is the artist's task to do his best work with what he has left. And I leave you with that note today, coaches, because that is my admonishment to you. It is the equivalent of your third string breaking on your Stradivarius, the condition of fatherlessness in the homes, the pressure that the internet puts on our kids, many of them who read, whether it's rivals, you name the, the recruiting service, who has dubbed them a four-star athlete when they really aren't a four-star athlete, but they behave like they are a four-star athlete, and, and, and their work ethic is really more like a one-star. And it impacts the culture of your team because others are looking at that same thing and said, he's a four? I'm a, I can act this way then too. He becomes a model and becomes a challenge for you as a coach. All of these forces are converging to create unprecedented pressure. So my word of encouragement to you is to understand the context of your times have changed and we've got to turn it up. We've got to turn it up to that next level. It's not an option. The conditions demand it. Dr. Martin Luther King said, if you can't be a pine on the top of the hill, be a bush if you can't be a tree. If you can't be a highway, just be a trail. If you can't be the sun, be a star. For it isn't by size that you win or you lose, just be the best at whatever you are. And that is within the reach of every single one of you in this room. May God bless you, may God bless this convention, and may God bless your mention as coaches. Thank you.